Good morning. I am Lorenzo Monserrat from A Coruña in Spain. And first of all, I want to thank Damendra and the organization for inviting me to give this talk and apologize for not being able to attend the meeting. I had a problem with the flight and I had not been able to arrive on time. So the topic is genomic evolution of diagnostic cardiology. And I will talk about the clinical perspective of a cardiologist working with genetics during the past 15 years and how this uh, use of the genetics and the perspectives in, and the environment has changed in this setting. My potential conflicts of interest, shareholder in Dilemma Solutions, a company dedicated to clinical decision support systems development and in health in code dedicated to genetic testing. When we talk about genetics in cardiology, we mainly talk about inherited cardiovascular diseases, conditions like cardiomyopathies, hypertrophic, arrhythmogenic, dilated cardiomyopathy, ventricular non-compaction, and related phenotypes. We talk about channelopathies, Brugada, Long QT syndrome, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, um, and, and others. And we talk about um, also vascular uh, diseases like uh, Marfan syndrome, Lois Diet syndrome, and aortic, uh, familial aortic dissection, and so on. We can also talk about the dyslipidemias with genetic origin that also have an impact in cardiovascular diseases. These are all of them monogenic conditions where genetic testing may have a very relevant role. Just to emphasize their common features. All of them are heterogeneous in their clinical presentation. In my opinion, this means that we don't face a single disease when we talk about hypertrophic homopathy, but we talk in reality about different conditions that may have different etiologies, but also about the uh, uh, relevant impact of environmental and additional factors in the phenotypic manifestation of the conditions. Early diagnosis many times is difficult and this is important because this, these diseases are also associated with sudden death risk, all of them. So early diagnosis may be a problem, but an early diagnosis may be useful for the identification of those people who are at risk for sudden death. They are familial. So the importance of genetics goes beyond the individual patient and we have always to consider that there is a family behind a patient with a potentially inheritable disease and of course the potential for genetic diagnosis that poses uh, opportunity, uh, generates opportunities in the management of the conditions, not only the patient but also in the family, but also uh, generates some challenges for the clinicians and especially when the clinicians are not the expert in genetic testing. Here we have an example of the recognition of the relevance of genetics in cardiovascular diseases. This is the 2008 paper on the classification of the cardiomyopathies, a position statement from the European Social Cardiology Working Group on Myocardial and Pericardial Diseases. This group recognized that the cardiomyopathies have both familial genetic forms and non-familial non-genetic forms. And when we talk about the familial forms, uh, here they are very aware that sometimes you can do disease classification after gen identification of the genetic cause, but in other many cases we have unidentified gene defect as uh, the origin of a familial disease. At that time, in 2008, we have quite an advanced knowledge on the genetics of these conditions. Here you see, this is taken from the paper, and we had already more than 80 genes. I, I have not the, the uh, exact amount because, if, for example, if you go to hypertrophic hormopathy, there are more than 40 genes involved in this, in this um, um, uh, slide. We have the sarcomeric protein genes, we have the glycogen storage diseases, POMPE, PRKG2, Far Forbes, Danone. We have lysosomal storage disease, Anderson Fabry, Hurlers. We have disorders of the fatty acid metabolism, many, many different conditions potentially involved, carnitine deficiency, 
and we have mitochondrial diseases that are also there is a large number of genes or relatively large number of genes that can be associated with a mitochondrial disease with cardiac involved in the form of either hypertrophic but also dilated cardiomyopathy. And finally, we had all the syndromic uh, rhizopathies, known and leopard and other, Friedrich, Friedrich ataxia and uh, Beckman uh, Biderman syndrome and others. So we have many genes, not only hypertrophic, also in restrictive, in dilated cardiomyopathy. And uh, the problem at that time is that we know that there are a lot of genes, but our capacity for evaluating all of them and our knowledge of other implications of the variants found in those genes was quite limited. So just to insist in this same paper, here you see in dilated cardiomyopathy, sorry, that we had only these genes reported. Beta myosin heavy change, troponin T, plus less other sarcomeric genes, and with particular phenotype, lamin, tafacin, desmin, dystrophin, and mitochondrial DNA. These are the genes that in some way were considered the main genes of interest in dilated cardiomyopathy for mutation screening in routine practice. So, a lot of knowledge about genes, but routine practice is limited. And why is it limited? Because we had Sanger sequencing, so this table is from the same the, the other paper in Europase, uh, Europase 2011, and this was me in 2011 trying to find the gene with a lot of expertise where I have to put my my focus. So at that time, in this same paper, they said dilated cardiomyopathy. None of the more than 25 known disease associated genes has been shown to account for more than 5% of the disease. So, don't care about genetic testing unless there is a specific phenotype of cardiac conduction defect. In that case, they recommended, or we recommended, I was not involved, but anyway, in sodium channel, not the main candidate in, in, indeed, and lamin AC. So this was the situation approximately in 2011, but then at that time, more or less, we started to have the possibility to evaluate more and more genes thanks to the uh, appearance of next generation sequencing. And even now, progressively, we have arrived to the situation that we can go to the whole exome and the whole genome. So all these techniques, and this is not the focus of my talk, to, uh, to talk about the technology, allows the sequencing in parallel of hundreds of thousands or thousands, hundreds of thousands of fragments and their posterior alignment versus the reference sequences with bioinformatic tools to generate a list of genetic variants versus the reference sequencing. And so we went to this situation from the classical Lorenzo approach in 2010, looking for the specific genes with the specific probe, to the industrial evaluation of everything that is, can be catched by next generation sequencing. So this resulted in an increasing recognition of the complexity of the diseases. And as an example, this paper of 2013 about dilated cardiomyopathy the complexity of a diverse genetic architecture. You have the one condition in the middle, on the focus of this paper, with many genes associated with this condition, and also many genes that are, apart from being associated with this condition, are associated with other disease. And the question is, each gene is one disease, has, has completely been discarded, I think, but still we have the tendency to try to classify or to say this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because, because you have a beta minus heavy chain mutation. And this may be right or wrong. So the same genes here involved in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy may cause dilated cardiomyopathy, also genes of desminopathies, neuromuscular diseases, or arrhythmic cardiomyopathy. They share etiology in terms of the genes that are involved. But this also is reflected in the phenotype, 
that in many occasions the same the same individual is diagnosed of one condition by one doctor and uh, and the diagnosis for other doctor is other condition and these are the overlapping phenotypes so multiple genes for one disease multiple diseases for one gene and overlapping phenotypes so in 2013 we already had a lot of information and we knew that there were many genes to be studied but this is 2016 European Society of Cardiology guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of acute and chronic heart failure. So this is an official document from a Heart Failure Association and that they, they really go back to focus in a very limited number of genes. So they say DCM is idiopathic in 50% and about one third of these are hereditary. This is something we can discuss, whether this is the right number, I think it's a bit low. And there are more than 50 genes identified associated with the disease, many of them related to the cytoskeleton, the most frequent titin, lamin, and desmin. So finally, they cite three genes, because it would be really boring to cite all the genes that could be involved, and because we have to focus on things that are practical and useful for most of the people. I don't know what is the reason, but I think that just this reductionism of the going to the most frequent things that may happen leaves a very primitive, uh, I think, approach to the medical practice in 2023. But this was 2016. So, at that time, this is an example of our Excel file in, in, in the company that I was leading at that time, Health in Code, where we were trying to keep updated with which were the genes we should consider. And here you have all the cardiomyopathies, and then you have hypertrophic column, then you have also the dilated cardiomyopathy and the channelopathies. And there are genes that appear in different columns, and there are many genes in each column. So it's complex even to really be able to make a list of which are the genes that are involved in each condition and of course there are different levels at that time we consider and everybody was doing the same genes that are definitely associated with the condition genes that are probably associated candidate genes and genes that are likely non-associated and there is an important group in these genes that are not associated in a condition is that those that are genes that are not associated with the condition but could be associated with a condition that can be confused with the condition associated with the gene. Sorry for this <laughs> a com complex sentence. Example, patient with a diagnosis of arrhythmia cardiomyopathy and you are testing for the plaque of filling, desmoplakin, desmocolin, desmoglein, and you don't find anything. And then you test for the potassium channel or for the sodium channel and you find a mutation associated with a long QT syndrome. This happens because in many uh, number of patients with a diagnosis of arrhythmia in the cardiomyopathy, they really don't have the disease. And, and in fact, some of the associations, for example, the association of rare receptor mutations with arrhythmia in the cardiomyopathy was based, in my opinion, and also in the opinion of some of the authors of that, the paper that established the association, was, as, was due to a confusion in the phenotype of the patients. So, what is the relevance of genetics in clinical practice in cardiology? The diagnosis of index and relatives is not discussed by anyone. Genetic counseling, the identification of the mutations, may help us to uh, really provide a good counseling for the individual and for the relatives. The prognosis, here there is a big discussion. For many people, still genetics is not useful for the prognosis, and this is something that in the last part of my talk I want to comment about. And for therapeutic decisions, and it's clear that now we have diseases that have a specific therapy, and genetic testing may help us to recognize them early, and this is the typical examples of Fabry disease or amyloid heart disease in hypertrophic and dilated cardiomyopathy. But now we also have new technologies and new uh, therapies that are um, um, based on, on the genetic diagnosis. 
and uh, and that time we we are sure that we will see them more and more in the clinical practice uh, at the same time we we will face uh, the situation of considering whether the different genetic variants have different uh, cause disease that has a different response to treatments and one example may be the new drugs used for relieving obstruction in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Finally, even if you don't have a therapeutic uh, um, strategy available for a given gene related to a condition, research keeps being important. You need to understand the disease and advance in its management and the classification and the understanding. In any case, genetics is becoming popular and with popular things uh, really sometimes okay, become simplified or sometimes become, I would say, not so exquisite as they should be. And I give you this example of this paper that for me has a lot of problems in the part of genetics. This is the 2021 ESC guidelines for the diagnosis and, and treatment of acute and chronic heart failure. So these are important guidelines that are read and followed by thousands of people or cardiologists, not only in Europe, but in many countries. They recognize that cardiomyopathies can be inherited, and in particular, those cardiomyopathies associated with heart failure and familial or acquired, and they say that finding a pathogenic variant in a patient with a cardiomyopathy allows better prediction of the disease outcome and progression, may contribute to the indication for the device implantation and inform genetic counseling for families. So really in favor of considering genetics as a key part of the evaluation of people with heart failure. And now when I read this paper I say, oh, Finally, we have a recognition of the relevance of genetics by the hair failure people. And then you go to the tables talking about the genes, no? and they say things that are really uh, interesting. No? The first is possible causes and disease modifiers of most frequent cardiomyopathies, and they say genetic mutations. And then you see the genes, and it's interesting. Now, what is MIPC? This is myosin binding protein C3, I guess, you know? And then the troponin T, we, the, we, the, there is a lack of a 2. And the southern channel, the minus the letter A, and the, the, we are mixing names of genes with names of proteins. And then you see hemochromatosis, HFE gene, C2Y2Y. This is a polymorphism, 5-10% of the, of the USA population carries these polymorphisms and the relation, I tell you, of this polymorphism with the development of the disease is something that has to be really re-evaluated. And then we have the galactosidase A also, again, the names, proteins instead of names of genes in a table of a guideline. And then they say about the, the syndromic disorders and they say mitochondrial X-linked mutations. And you know that nuclear genes are 99% of mitochondrial proteins and many of the proteins involved in the diseases are not X-linked inheritance. Many of them are autosomal recessive. So for me, this, this table reflects a lack of uh, a deep interest in, in really providing an accurate information in something that is important. We go ahead with the paper. Table 28, no? The hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, specific aspects of diagnosis and treatment. And they say minimal set of genes. And you see titin lamin MHC, which is, I guess, MYHC, troponin T, troponin C, MYBPC, uh, so RBM20 and RBM RMB phospholamban, sodium channel, alpha subunit, and this is the minimal set of genes in hypertrophic hormopathy, BAC3. So this is, these are not the genes. And then they say specific conditions, mitochondrial X-linked again, no, FHL1. 
and then go to arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and appears here the the sodium channel the fill fln fln ldb3 afactinin and kx25 and then you have the potassium channels related to long qt syndrome and uh, trpm4 and, and these are the the key specific aspects of diagnosis and treatment the minimal set of genes so i think this is really um, strange no so these genes are in my opinion and maybe i am wrong are not should not be considered minimal genes in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in fact i think they are not related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and these genes the same in in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy This is something that I'm sorry I'm not there for discussing with you. We keep working with the guideline, no? And they say minimal set of genes. This is dilated cardiomyopathy. And then again, the names of the genes are incorrect. So this is the minimal. Even the, the genes may be right for the disease. The, the names are not correctly written. They get names of putting together proteins and, and, and genes, no? And it's interesting, filamin C is not included in the minimal set of genes for dilated cardiomyopathy. This is one of the relevant genes to be evaluated in patients because of the risk of sudden death with a mild phenotype. And then we have other, and again, if you put FLN, which is not minimal, but is others, no? And this, so it's interesting. Filamin C is not in the minimal set, and then when they say which are the early indications for primary prevention by ICD, they say FLN, which is not filament C, it's, it's an incomplete name of the gene. And then they say titin mutation, higher rate of ventricular reversal modeling, up to 7%, but a, a higher risk of atrial and ventricular tachyarrhythmia. So it's interesting how you go to that, those kind of details and don't say anything about other genes, no? For me, the term of mutation generally is not recommended. We should change for pathogenic variant just to avoid confusion of what is a mutation and what is not a mutation. Only some variants are pathogenic. So th there is no specification in this guideline or in the tables that you have to consider that the first thing is to really, when you find a variant in a gene, you cannot say you have the gene. You have to say you have a variant and then the, we have to evaluate the pathogenicity and even other, other uh, we, we should even go farther than that, but not, not now to discuss. And there is a serious risk of misunderstanding because not all the, pathogen, all the pathogenic variants have the same risk. And this good example is filamin C. So you have a missense variant in filamin C. Most of the cases, and I would say almost, almost 100%, is not going to be relevant. I'm sorry, I'm making a mistake except those variants that are related with restrictive phenotypes. But many of the variants you find are not relevant, but you have a truncating variant and usually you have a big problem. So this was 2021. Now I think we are in, luckily we are improving. No, these are, these are the last guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology on Cardiomyopathies putting together information about the different cardiomyopathies and in some way recognizing this, that the relevance of these overlapping phenotypes and that we have to consider all these diseases in, in, a, in, in the same context, no? So these guidelines, yeah, I think, change the approach and this is, I think, a good thing because now we have uh, the dif different multiple genes, for example, this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and they evaluate the genes similar way we were doing a number of years ago in many in many of the labs doing genetics and some genes are definitely associated with the condition are the most relevant and frequent genes but there are other genes that have to be considered because even they are less frequent they may be the disease causing variants and the, and it's important for the patients who carry them and then there are genes that have been proposed but that the evidence is not sufficient to really consider them related to the disease and this has to be known by the experts dealing with genetic testing. In this paper, we have seen that some sm small number of, of uh, studies 
and this is for me, this is the disappointing part of the guideline. Small number of studies have explored the prognostic value of sarcomeric variants in hypertrophic chromopathy, and the classification as malignant or benign uh, then um, has been questioned. And the variants that were initially classified as malignant or benign can have very different phenotypic expression even in the same family. And finally, based on this data and all and all, we do not recommend the use of the presence of sarcomeric variants to guide decisions around ICD implantation for primary prevention in individuals with a low or intermediate sudden cardiac risk score. So for me, this is uh, really the question is the identification of the gene is sufficient. We have not to care about which variant in the gene is the variant involved in my family. Is that the, really the conclusion? The situation that someone described an association with a malignant phenotype that was then discarded by other papers means that there is no relevance in these associations and there is no information for any of the variants to say something to the families and to make some decisions. I think this is wrong. Sometimes talking with uh, Barry Elliott, he says, you know, but if you have a variant that is bad, but the phenotype is good, you you, there is no problem. And this is not always true. And I would say that this is kind of trying to avoid the problem. Okay. In my opinion, we have challenges and we have opportunities. Of course, one of the main challenges is how to distinguish the lobsters from the rabbits. But there are a lot of opportunities and we will comment about that in the next slides. When we talk about genetic variants, we have to consider that we have variants that are frequent in the population, the polymorphism, and there are variants that are rare that usually were called as mutations. But those variants that are so rare in the population with very low frequency, not all of them are pathogenic. And at the same time, and we know now that some of the variants that appear in the population with frequencies that are not so low may be pathogenic or may contribute to disease development. So this is the main challenge now, is the interpretation. I, in this slide I put more than 3,000 variants. Now there are, if you test more genes, you have more variants to evaluate and classify in each individual and do the interpretation. And also we have to be aware that even now with our advanced technologies, the yield of genetic testing is not so high. In this slide, I say, for example, in hypertrophic amoebae, 60, 70 percent, but most laboratories now give us a numbers of 40 percent of the patients with a variant that is identified that is associated with the condition. So we have also here a challenge on what is the reason of the disease when we don't find a genetic variant that is responsible for the condition. So what are the opportunities today? Okay, one is to capacity to evaluate all the genes in controls. And this is very important because we have learned a lot with the projects, with the, um, with the uh, clinical genome problems that are on, ongoing, reporting the, pre the prevalence or the frequency of variants in different populations for all the variants that are uh, uh, versus the consensus sequences. We have the opportunity to study all the relevant genes in all the patients. And this is not a minor opportunity because when you study a patient and the yield of the test is 40 to 50 percent, this means that you, in at least half of the patient, you are going to end without a diagnosis and there are other genes that could be tested. The interpretation may be difficult. But this is, this is our uh, task to really improve the interpretation. We can evaluate all types of variants. Now, the variants that were initially not uh, amenable for testing, like copy number variation, intronic variants, are now available for us. We can evaluate all the genes in cases and controls. So when you study a patient with hypertrophic homeopathy, you have the opportunity to test also the genes for long QT. And this is important because in patients that we know the phenotype, you can do case control studies. And at the same time, you can find incidental findings that are relevant for the management. And this allows us to identify new genes in many instances and the potential to study genotype, phenotype, prognosis relations. 
So we will review briefly each one of these opportunities. So the first, all genes in controls, no? This is the typical situation with many conditions in the early times of Sanger sequencing, no? That we, 20 novel mutations in 35 families. And here it's important to remark that some of these variants now we know they are not pathogenic, they are not disease causing, even some people are still discussing. This is one of the papers, you see other paper and all the screenings you find variants. Because in Fabry disease the screens were based or not, and are still are based many times in evaluating the alpha galactosidase activity and those patients who have lower activity versus the controls were evaluated and then it was not taken in consideration the presence of pseudo deficiency and the presence of a low alpha galactosidase activity was sufficient to consider that we were in front of a Fabry disease patient. So if you see this other paper, you see the same variants appearing again and again and being responsible for a relevant numbers of the patients included in these studies. Just to show you a summary, GLA variants present in the general population, previously associated with Fabry disease in some papers, that appear in the, at, at that time in the, in the exon variant server database. So this was D313, tyrosine. This is a, a variant that is associated with pseudo deficiency. Uh, 8 in 1,000, 5 in 1,000 in males and females. Uh, alanine 143, treonine 3 in 1,000, 1 in 1,000. The arginine 118, cysteine variant, also previously associated and still some people consider maybe some relation to the disease and these others. So if you put all together, 1% of the population carries one of these variants, both in females and males. And this is an X-linked condition. And if you take out the ASP313, even 0.5%, which is a number quite high. So the, this is the opportunity, testing controls. We understand what things are related and what things are likely not related to the disease because of their prevalence in the general population. Opportunities to study all the relevant or potentially relevant genes in all the patients. You see ventricular fibrillation case, eight years old girl living in the UK from the Turkish family. She had an out of hospital ventricular fibrillation. She was resuscitated. And initially she had an epoxic encephalopathy with a posterior recovery. And there was no family history of uh, cardiomyopathies or channelopathies. So we were looking for the genes associated with the suspected etiology, which was short QT. And we didn't find a mutation. But as we had next generation sequencing, we evaluated all the genes in the panel of sudden death, and we found a mutation in the SLC22A5. And this is the gene associated with primary carnitine deficiency, and it was almost cycles. And this is interesting because at that time we evaluated the literature for making the report. And what we found is that it was a short report of a family of Turkish origin with the same variant of the girl and with a, a silent and symptomatic primary carnitine deficiency within the same family. So this is a pathogenic variant in homozygosis, but there was no description of the relation with long QT. But the, so this was an hypothesis at that time that really, uh, sorry, sorry, it's about short QT, but then the, several papers came later showing that carnitine deficiency may really induce a short QT syndrome, and maybe the cause of the sudden death in this girl. Other opportunities, as I said, uh, all type of variants, no? So, as I told you, the, the ill of death in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this was from our lab, 52% were negative, 41% positive, and 7% inconclusive. So, what is the etiology in this 52% of negative cases? One example are cryptic splice altering variants in genes. In, in particular, in myosin binding protein C, we have found a number of cases. No? For, for example, this variant, which is in minus 52, or the variant in minus 80 related to the splicing, consensus splicing site, all these variants that are far from the splicing site and usually not evaluated are associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
because of the generation of, of activation of creative display sites leading to frames if and stop codons. So these are new opportunities with these technologies. This is another example. This is a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and renal failure, 44, asthenia, proteinuria, renal function deterioration, fever intermittent recurrent, the renal biopsy, membranous proliferative glomerular nephritis, laminated deposits compatible with Fabry disease, small vessel cerebral vascular disease, concentric hypertrophy, 20 70 millimeters, short PR and left ventricular hypertrophy on the ECG, and the mother with a diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy when she was 48, and syncope and a pacemaker and renal failure, nephrotic syndrome, who died when she was 67. What is the diagnosis? The diagnosis clearly is a suspicion of Fabry disease. And then we did genetic testing and we found that she was heterozygous for the arginine 118 cysteine variant. But this is a variant that, as we said before, initially described as pathogenic, we think that it couldn't explain this kind of disease. And we were co-authors of this paper, no, showing that this variant was really not associated with the phenotype. So what happened here? Something that may happen, see it happens. This patient had a deletion, a mesigous deletion, with the absence of exons 3 and 4 of the gene. And this was the pathogenic variant. And these things have to be co taken in consideration. Do not stop with the first variant. Other opportunities to evaluate all the genes in case and controls and identify new genes. We had identified several genes like this. This, for example, TRIN63. It was a candidate for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because in mice there was exaggerated hypertrophy um, in response to stress and because there was a paper on the genetic mutations associated with the skeletal myopathy and hypertrophic heart in one family, so we included the gene in our panels. And we sequence a lot of individuals of this gene that is related to the um, uh, ubiquitin ligase and substrate degradation in the heart. What happened? If we sequence more than 11,000 index cases with different diseases, almost 5,000 with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 3,600 with other cardiomyopathies, 3,000 with other cardiovascular diseases, childopathies, vas uh, vascular conditions. And what we found is 19 homozygous or component homozygous in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 0.4%, only one in other cardiomyopathies, and it was a restricted cardiomyopathy, which is I would say a phenotype that may be overlapping with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and we didn't find anything in other cardiovascular diseases. And these variants do not appear commonly in the general population, of course. So we, when we evaluated the relatives, 57, we found three homozygous and one component heterozygous that were clinically affected, and the single heterozygous were unaffected. And what is the phenotype? It's a severe hypertrophy with a lot of fibrosis. Uh, with an autosomal recessive form of the disease. So this is the opportunity of really testing genes that are candidates and turn out to be really disease-associated conditions. Here, more than, more than 20 institutions participated in this paper to really put together all these cases. And still, some people think that this gene is not definitely associated with the condition. I, I don't understand the reason. Other cases, the ALP, K3, no? Here the, <laughs> there are a number of papers <coughs> showing that BLL2 K3 mutations for a severe pediatric cardiomyopathy and that appears in the infancy and with uh, concentric hypertrophic and severe systolic dysfunction. Here we see one of, example of one of these papers. And so in these families, it's interesting because we had homozygotes with a severe disease, but we had some also some heterozygous carriers. So we included uh, the gene in our testing panels, and what turned to be is, apart from some homozygous or component heterozygous, we found truncating variants in this gene in 1.56% of the patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, more than 2,800 patients, 
with an odds ratio of more than 16 versus other phenotypes and with co-segregation in the families. So these are some of the families where the variants co-segregated with disease with incomplete penetrance. And this is from the group from London, they lead this paper. And uh, finally, we really published that the association of truncating variants as a cause of autosomata, autosomal dominant hypertrophic aromopathy, and not only as a recessive condition. Finally, this well, another case was the forming homology two domain containing three protein, FHO3. Uh, the same strategy was lead, led us to find that this a gene that associated with one to two percent of the cases of hypertrophic aromopathy. And it's interesting because it's not only that some genetic variants cause autosomal dominant disease, it's that there are variants that are associated with a, pre a predisposition to the development of hypertrophic aromopathy in a kind of polygenic way and something that I think will be discussed later in, the, in this meeting. So, opportunities. Finally, potential to study genotype, phenotype and prognosis. The prognostic determinants related to genetics are one, to have the correct diagnosis. With a correct diagnosis, you cannot establish a prognosis. Two, the novo and double mutations are relevant when family history is not sufficient because you don't recognize risk of sudden death if the mutation is not present in the family, in the in the relatives. And of course, if you have two if you are homozygous, you don't have the same prognosis as your heterozygous parents. And the prognosis may be associated with the specific genes, this is the question, and with different genetic variants. Let's see. What we did is to really take data, patients, families, diseases, mutations, from many, many papers, and try to put it in a database, for try to make really um, advance in the establishing of their uh, phenotype associated with different variants. For that, we put different experts to really put the data in a database and be able to generate the reports. And these are some of the results. This is hypertrophic homopathy and prognosis of long uh, life expectancy with different genes. And here what we did is, this is all-cause mortality. All-cause mortality, oh, oh, sorry, all-cause mortality, no, this is cardiovascular mortality. It's sudden death, heart failure related death. And we put, to, we put not only the index patients coming to the clinic, we are always alive. We collected all the relatives to see, and to, we put the age of death, of they were alive, if they were carriers. And here you see the different genes, GLA, PRKG2, the worst here is LAM2, the best is GLA, and in the middle you see difference, significant, sometimes not very big, but if you take myosin binding protein C in orange, compare to the PRKAG2 or in red to troponin I, they are different prognoses. But the prognosis is not dependent only on the genes. Just uh, the numbers here, we are talking about more than 2,900 in, in beta myosin and 100 in the LAM2. This all is coming from the literature, or 90% of this information. The prognosis depends on gene and gender. And of course, here you see Danone in, the worst is Danone in males, but the second is Danone in females, and then in orange is beta myosin in, in, male, in females, and in blue is beta myosin in males. And the other is GLA in females in red and in males in green. And you see that not only for X-linked genes, but also for beta myosin and for other genes, there are differences depending on the gender. Here you see, this is the age of clinical manifestation. When, when is the patient receives a diagnosis of the disease and putting together the data from the literature, you see different curves. So the, the earliest is uh, PTPN11 in this slide and the uh, later uh, in uh, here is interesting because they are the same, almost the same curve for myosin binding protein C and FHOD3. We think that these genes have something that relate them. Uh, it's in something interesting for, for being evaluated. And here you see in orange and in green, is this is our, the converted region, 
One is the converter region and the other is the helix. So different regions of the genes have different age of onset and different prognosis. Let's see in detail. This is the information about 2,000 patients with hypertrophic hormopathy related to beta myosin heavy chain mutations. Uh, hi sorry, hypertrophic or dilated. And you see what is the evolution. This is the survival curve for the mutation glycine 716 arginine. It's very different from the average for beta myosin. So not all the genetic variants are the same. It's interesting, this variant is in, a, in, a, in different, if we take the regions of the gene, of the, of the, pro, sorry, of the protein, uh, we have the regions like the head of the protein, or, the, or you have specific domains, and this variant is in the converter domain of the protein, which is involved in fourth generation. But in particular, it's within a small helix within this converter domain that we think is important. It's important because if you put together data, here you see the misense variance in the beta myosin in blue. This is the converter region in red, the survival. And this is our glycine 716 arginine in, in orange. And this, this is the helix where this variant is in green. And here you put together in green, you put 130 individuals. So there are differences depending on the functional region that is affected in the gene. Not only the prognosis, of course, the morphology and evolution depend on the specific mutation. So here what we did is to plot the maximal wall thickness, in this case is females, against age in beta myosin heavy chain mutations. And you see, it's quite a wide dispersion. I, we try to draw this curve, not to adjust the kind of average, but you see the big dispersion of the thickness. But if you go to a specific domain that we were talking about, the helix, is not so dispersed. And what you see is you have a quick increase in the, fast increase in the thickness with the age. And you are here, you are 15 years old is the maximum. And then there are not so thick hearts later in life. And what happens? One is thinning and the other is death. The people with thicker hearts may, be, may have died, but also they, the people, we, we think that most likely they progress to the thinning. And the problem is that when you are here, sometimes the phenotype is not so severe. When I hear, maybe you have a severe hypertrophy, but when you die, it's usually when you develop the fibrosis and you have th thinner hearts. All these things should be studied. Final example, troponin T. No? With troponin T, we put all the variants. This is a gene that has been associated with increased risk of death, sometimes with not a marked phenotype in terms of hypertrophy. This is the survival curve of, of a troponin T, putting all the variants together. And here you see in blue, light blue, this is the proportion with sudden death. And this pink, or, uh, this pink is uh, hair failure death. So hair failure death increases with age and younger individuals usually die suddenly. This is a case with a troponin T mutation, arginine 94 leucine, described by McKenna uh, some years ago. And here you see these patients died suddenly with this array but no hypertrophy. And this was a call of, oh, because, be, be, because it's with the troponin T mutations. May be dangerous. If you have this is the troponin T, and now we plot here, and the, uh, sorry, this is not the troponin T, this is the hot spot, 92 to 95 positions in the troponin T, which is worse than the troponin T in general, but similar. But not all the mutations in troponin T are the same. We have a founder effect in Galicia with a lot of families consolidating with the asparagine. Uh, 271 isoleucin bi genetic variant and the survival curve is completely different. It's, a, it's, we would say, a benign mutation. And now if we compare, now we put the gender, here you see in red, this is the good mutations in female, in green in males, in orange is the females with the 92 to 95 hotspot mutations, and in blue are the males with the same. And you see that you are 50, how different it is to have a 60% survival to have a 95, 98% survival. So 
prognostic information is there, we need to dig for it. So opportunities, diagnosis, genetic counseling, prognosis, therapeutic decisions and research. Thank you very much. Here are some of the people that have contributed to the generation of these results. And thanks for your attention. And, and again, apologies for not being there.